This is a Schofield Stories, and today I'm joined by none other than Mark Colburn, MB. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hi there, Callum. How are you, my friend? I'm very well, thank you, and all the better now that you're here. That's very kind of you, very kind of you. Thanks to technology, you know, how we can communicate to, uh, to your audience. So, yes, it's a privilege, you know, to be on your show. It's a privilege to reach out, you know, and speak to, you know, maybe millions of people around the world to share my key principles and key messages on how to win with mindset. It really is. And that is exactly why I wanted you on the show. You were top on my list for this season and you hit the nail on the head instantly. Win with mindset. So why don't you briefly explain to my listeners, what was your life like before you were Mark Colburn, MB? What was your normality? Yes, that's actually a, a very good question. Um, I grew up in South Wales in the United Kingdom. I was born in 1969. I was the son of Margaret and Cecil, who was my late father. And I didn't know this at the time, Callum, but my dad, who worked in the, the British Steel Corporation factory as a crane driver for 40 years, actually, was, was actually known as Mr. Nice Guy. And I didn't know this when I was a child, you know, I didn't know this. I, I found this out, you know, later on in life when my dad retired from the, from the steelworks. So born in 1969 in a very strong labor constituency in South Wales, in a town that was probably not really that famous until people understand and know who actually came from that town. And a very famous gentleman who came from that town is called Aniron Bevan and otherwise known as Nye Bevan. And Aniron Bevan was a, a Labour politician who actually transformed the NHS, you know, um, you know, many years before I was born. But that's the kind of stock, that's the kind of environment that obviously I've come from, whereby very hardworking, uh, very kind people, you know, within the village, within the town. So life in the 70s, as you can imagine, was just normal working class, you know, my dad was a crane driver, my mother was a, a school caretaker. Um, not that I saw very much of them because, you know, you can imagine on the weekends, I just wanted to ride my bike and kick a football. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, like most people, I suppose, in South Wales. But life was, yeah, the memories from, from the 70s were, were brilliant, were wonderful, strong memories, you know, uh, long summers, you know, eight, nine, ten weeks of just wonderful sunshine and those memories are still with me now you know albeit you know 40 years on I suppose you know so so what was my life like um, as I said my life was just normal you know working class parents uh, no brothers or sisters but the one thing that I enjoyed more than anything else was the feeling of sport and what sport can give you you know it can give you exhilaration you know that you feel um, it gives you those nerves, you know, those, those nerve feelings, you know, the tingles, um, apprehension, obviously, fear, doubt, uncertainty. But I guess from a very young age, I just had this desire just to, de yeah, the desire to win. You know, I, I don't feel I'm an egotistic type person. Um, I'm very driven, but I have the values, the great values in life you know, uh, kindness, um, and very polite, or, or I feel I am. <laughs> and, and then from the 70s, from the 1970s into the 1980s, you know, obviously school, you know, which was great, comprehensive school, loved it, you know, had the chance to play lots of sport, lots of different sports, you know, represented my school and my county in athletics. So I had lots of power, very fast on my feet, you know, back then, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but at the same time, just enjoying the journey, which was really, really important for me. So the 70s and the 80s was fun, hard work, you know, obviously working hard in school. And, and then when I went on to college, you know, in 1986, 87, um, that's when uh, I suppose my appreciation for sport really, really went to the next level, you know. Is it fair to say that you're very proud of your heritage, proud of where you come from? Very much so. You know, great question. You know, I'm very proud to be Welsh through and through. Um, I'll get this one out of the way. 
Um, I'm actually ashamed that I don't speak Welsh. You know, my, my native language, um, m- maybe apart from maybe the Welsh anthem, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I think I've just learned through repetition, you know, um, just thousands and thousands of times of singing it. And, uh, and it's only the last of two or three years that I've actually looked at um, what the anthem means in English language then, you know. So for anybody listening to this podcast and certainly for people, you know, watching this on Callum's YouTube channel, then, uh, then just go and Google. Just go and Google or YouTube, you know, the Welsh National Anthem. And, and I guess, yeah, just, just turn up the volume. <laughs> and enjoy it, yeah. you know. So, so yeah, being very proud, you know, of being Welsh, seeing the history of Wales evolve, you know. Um, if you go back to, you know, I studied history in school. If you go back to the Industrial Revolution, you know, when in South Wales we had, you know, so many pits, coal pits, coal mines, open cast mines, iron works, you know, steel works, and we literally, literally built Britain off the steel that we produced, you know, in Wales. So, so yeah, I'm very proud. Um, I, I'm almost very appreciative of the incredible line of famous people that have obviously evolved and, uh, and, and who have come from Wales. Some people, you know, some of those people still live in Wales. Many of those people have traveled, you know, across the world and set up businesses <clears throat> or families, um, you know, very successful families. And I've been privileged very privileged to meet, you know, some of those very successful people in the four corners of the world, you know. So if you're listening to this podcast, maybe you know somebody in your town or city um, or your region who's actually from Wales, you know, because in my experience, Callum, we're everywhere. <laughs> we definitely are. And I find at least whenever you say you're Welsh, someone always has a positive story about another Welshman to tell you. Yes, very, very true. You know, I remember being in Los Angeles in 2012 and, um, and obviously we'll come on to the cycling part of my life, you know, further on in this podcast and interview. But I remember sitting at the table and we were out training on, on the bikes one, one afternoon and just sat there having coffee with my teammates. And this gentleman just walked over from one of the tables, you know, and in this almost half Welsh, half American accent, said uh, hey man are you from wales i said yes how, how, how do you know that my great grandfather was from swansea i was like wow, wow. <laughs> you know i'm twelve thousand miles away from home and this gentleman recognized the accent you know so i'm very proud to you know very proud to be welsh you know and and i suppose for people who are listening to this podcast When you look at the history of Wales as a whole, as a country, and what we've given, you know, the world is is, is mind-blowing. You know, it really, really really is mind-blowing. When you peel back the layers, you know, when you look at uh, at where we started and obviously what we've gone through, as I said, with the Industrial Revolution and, uh, and certainly what we're bringing now to the world stage, whether it's sport, business, entrepreneurship, So for anybody listening to this podcast, you know, please feel free to, to Google, you know, the history of Wales, which is, uh, which is pretty epic in itself. You know. I completely agree. And for any listeners who are wondering why this is relevant or why we're talking about this, I personally think it's very important to get this authentic feel and really get to know you, Mark, as this is the first time we've spoken in detail and for many of my listeners this is a chance for them to get to know you, get to know where you've come from. I think that's very important in general. It, it creates better rapport, they say, don't they? Very much so. And I think it's important for, for anybody, you know, watching this recording or listening to the podcast that you, you understand where it all started. And your first question was absolutely on point. You know, where did it start? Where did I grow up? What was my school in life? Who were my friends? You know, what was my experience? as a young lad growing up in the 1970s and the 1980s, when, as I said, you know, life was very, very different to today. You know, we didn't have the internet, (laughs) you know, we certainly didn't have, um, you know, iPhones and FaceTime and Zoom calls 
um, you know, when literally to communicate, you literally had to either send a letter, um, you know, or if you were privileged enough, you actually had a phone in the house, you know, <laughs> with, uh, with a wire on it. How weird is that? You know, I speak to young children now and, and they think I'm telling lies, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very, very different. Um, but the, the, the great part of my journey is uh, I guess I had a, a great grounding, you know, with my dad, um, who was a very wise gentleman, um, you know, a very gentle soul. He was my, I guess, my hero. You know, he was my go-to guy, because as I said, I didn't have any brothers or sisters. Um, my hero, my inspiration, and I just learned so much from him, you know, so much from him as a, as a very quiet, calm thinker. My dad was a thinker, and this is where, I guess I, I get my patience from, you know, I certainly get my understanding from, and, uh, and obviously we miss him, you know, we, 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 have, we, we miss him dearly, you know, we really do. So, uh, so yeah, the seventies and eighties, just to wrap up that part of the question was great fun, you know, it was great fun. And we can already see the little hints of mental resilience, determination, that love for sport seeping through, already so as you got a bit older what made you push yourself what made you try new things and let's see this love for sport flourish yes i think i i um i remember this moment um i, I honestly hand on heart can't remember if i was 10 or if i was 11 years of age but as i said when i was a kid i loved sport okay i just loved the feeling that it gave me um the freedom the exhilaration you know, whether I, you know, whether I won races or whether I didn't win races, it didn't matter. It was just the taking part that gave me the experience. And I'm sure I was either 10 or 11 years of age. And my dad understood that I had lots of energy. And he always said to me, Mark, you don't have a stop button. Okay, you don't have a stop button. Please, please, please be careful. And I didn't understand what he meant, you know, because I was 10 or 11 and I was just this, crazy kid with lots of energy, you know, and I would play football in the morning, I'd go and play rugby in the afternoon and maybe then play cricket in the evening, you know, and, and I'll never forget my dad pulling me to one side in the house in my mother and father's kitchen and, and saying to me, you know, Mark, please, please, please just be careful because remember, you only have one opportunity in life. You only, you only have one chance. And I said, what do you mean? what do you mean one chance you know i just wasn't aware of the process of life of being born we live and then we pass on you know and he said well let, let me explain okay that one day in the future tomorrow will be your last day so i just let that penny drop and i said to him what, what do you mean so he explained the process you know of being born we live and we pass on and he said these words the most important part is the part in the middle. So, so whatever you're going to work for in the future when you start working, whatever you aspire for, whatever you dream for, just remember that whatever those items, those materialistic things are, the one day in the future you're going to hand them back. Because technically you only borrow those things, the, the, the house, the car, the shoes, the bags, the, I don't know, yacht you know holiday home whatever you you only borrow those things because then when you pass on you hand them back you know and and the penny dropped the penny dropped i got it and what he said to me was this the one thing you can aspire for the one thing that you can acquire and keep with you even when your eyes close for good are feelings emotions decisions friendships friendships <laughs> that's a good one that's a good one and and those experiences that you gather through your life because that's what you take with you you know and the penny dropped Callum and I got it I got it I was either 10 or 11 and I got it and every day thereafter I made sure that I lived every day like it was my last you know absolutely and I think that's advice that everyone needs or everyone needs to hear as even me i was starting thinking wow that is incredible so is it fair to say that 
you took those words and they stayed with you. Very much so. You know, I'm now 50 years of age. You know, it's the 1st of July 2020 today. And uh, I'm 40 years on, you know, almost you know, 40 years on every day. You know, not a day has gone by when that thought, those feelings come into my body. You know, and it's the same for you as a young man. You know, you, you've gone through trauma, you know, with obviously your situation, you know, um, with what you're dealing with uh, personally, uh, physically, spiritually. Um, even through a humility perspective, that some days you wake up, I don't know whether you get this feeling, but some days you wake up and you think to yourself, I, I wish that I was slightly different. You know, I wish that this um, stammer, I wish that this um, physical part of me, I could, just, I could just leave somewhere. Does that make sense? And yet it, it's completely who you are. It makes you... Yeah, it, it makes you who you are, you know? So, so, so that's something to just embrace, you know, um, from, from my perspective anyway. But um, yeah, it's very true that people sometimes should, should just be 100% grateful, you know, for who they are, what they have, you know, because we all want to aspire for the, you know, the, the, the million pound yacht, you know, the, the house in, I don't know, Monaco. <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, the odd helicopter or two, but um, in, in my experience, um, it, it's the journey, you know, it's the, the journey that, um, that, that has the value, you know, and, and certainly those people around you. And I've been very grateful and very privileged to have incredible friends for such a long time, you know, such a long time. So what you said there is completely right, especially about myself personally. Since I started advertising my stammer, advertising who I am, talking openly, I don't know about you, but I found when you're open about yourself, your relationships get stronger, they get deeper, they get a lot more meaningful, with people are more willing to be open with you as well. So it does work both ways. And that can be a challenge, just opening up about stuff that at one point you might, or you weren't too proud of. Well, I think, you know, it's going through the, um, the process called the Kobler-Ross change curve, okay? And we all go through it. Every human being goes through it when the situation changes from what it was to what it is now, okay? So in your case, being authentic, okay? In the very beginning, and, and I'm just going to assume you, so, you know, please, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but when you identified your stammer, you went through denial, which is the first stage of the Kobler Ross change curve because you didn't want to have a stammer. You wanted to just speak like everybody else. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Bang on. <laughs> yes. So, so the first stage of change is denial. Okay. You, you don't want to go from, you know, um, w where you were into where you are. Okay. The second stage is shock because you suddenly think, holy shit, why am I different? Why, why am I different to everybody else? Why doesn't everybody else stammer? Okay, so if I can have your permission to speak openly, okay, um, yeah. you, you, that's how you feel. And that's normal. That's okay. Okay, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And then the third stage is that you get that um, feeling of, of anger. So you go through denial, shock, then anger, because you can't change it. Okay, you, at the time you feel you can't change it. And then the fourth stage then, okay, is you feel lonely or empty because you're not like everybody else. Does that make sense? And we'll come, on to my, we'll come on to my accident and my disability you know, in a few minutes, but that feeling, you can't change. It's in you. It's a, a, an inert feeling that you, you can't change. And I commend you for what you've done through changing the circumstance. Does that make sense? So in my opinion, you know, you've, you've gone through almost an, an Olympic training program. Think about this. You know, you, I'm, I'm going to say it, okay? I'm going to say it. You're world class at what you do. There is not many people. No, I mean this, okay? I'm not just saying it because you're on the call. But I, I know, having been from where I was to representing my country, you know, at the very highest pinnacle in sport, in the Olympics, it doesn't get any bigger, okay? It doesn't get any bigger. So it's important to understand that you're world class at what you do. Not many people would make that decision to have 
a stammer, but then want to do something with it. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's so important for, for the listeners and people watching the video on YouTube to understand that, you know, you made a massive decision. I mean, a massive decision to change. You could have just stayed where you were, doing what you were doing, dealing with the stammer, but you made a conscious decision to change. And that, for people listening to this, is such a massive motivation. You know, you're an inspiration as a young man who has an incredible podcast show, you know, wonderful videos on YouTube with the expectations, as you said in the beginning, to, to be open, to be honest, to have the great values, to treat every person like your best friend. You know, nobody's any different on this planet. You know, we all have um, a belly button. <laughs> yeah. You know, we all have a belly button, a stomach and a pulse. Okay, so, so we are no different, you know, just different colors, different shapes, um, you know. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously really, really important, um, you know, for people to obviously recognize that. So I commend you, you know, I really, really do. Thank you. And it just goes to show as this time last year, for a bit of context, I was flipping burgers at McDonald's in fear of any speaking situation. I couldn't say my name. And now I'm here interviewing Olympic gold medalist Mark Colburn like it's the most normal thing in the world. And in the space of a year, it, it, it blows my mind still. I find it very bizarre. Yeah, and I think the important thing for, for you to realise as a young man is, um, you know, you will um, inspire, you know, generations to come. You know, you really, really will. So we talk about change and how this stage is and it can have a massive impact on you. Explain how that relates to you and your story. Yes, very much so. I think that's a great question, actually, because, you know, as the audience now um, understand, I was just a normal guy growing up in South Wales, a young lad, um, you know, studied in comprehensive school, went to college, um, studied sports science, you know, in, in college and loved it. Just loved the, the information about anatomy, physiology, you know, sports science. Obviously, we didn't really technically have biomechanics back then, you know, albeit maybe in, um, in Olympic sports, but, you know, obviously I, I wasn't, um, I wasn't exposed to, you know, that, uh, that Olympic uh, environment back then, I guess, you know. Um, so I think how it impacted me, you know, certainly then when I started working uh, at the age of 21, uh, believe it or not, Callum, I was actually um, a, a stained glass designer for 10 years and lots of people oh, don't wow. know that. <laughs> Oh, I was expecting that. <laughs> yes, yes. A lot of people say to me, so what did you do between 21 and 40? You know? Um, so yeah, I designed stained glass for uh, 10 years, actually, and loved it. Loved it because I, I loved using my mind. I loved using my creativity to, um, I, I guess, develop projects that took, you know, some of the projects took weeks and weeks and weeks, you know, to, uh, to formulate, create, design, manufacture and then fit, you know, for local authorities and companies all around the United Kingdom, you know. So I think to, to go through that process of change all through my life, um, just having many different experiences that, um, I guess, challenged me, um, frustrated me, because at the time I didn't know how to use my mind. You know, I didn't know how to have calmness uh, karma. I didn't. I did just didn't know how to operate my mind in in the way that I do now. If that makes sense, you know. So then, all through the nineties, um, I got married, um, and then in nineteen ninety four, my daughter Jessica, you know, was born. A wonderful, wonderful young lady, young kid, just a, an angel, you know. And I don't just say that openly because she's my daughter, but she genuinely is a really nice person. And now she's. You know, she's 26 now, she's six foot tall, you know. Um, so it was a, a great time in the 90s seeing this wonderful, um, you know, female human being grow up, um, you know, into a, a very arduous, um, astute, but clever, you know, young girl having then gone to, you know, obviously through schooling and then university. So I'm very proud of her, you know, as, uh, as, her, as her dad, you know, I guess, having, having walked um, I guess having walked through those footsteps myself, um, which were the same footsteps as my dad, you know, walked. So, um, 
so yeah, I feel I had a great grounding, you know, I really do. So, so then obviously from the 1990s into the 2000s, into the millennium, you know, when everybody, everybody was told the world was going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're so glad it didn't, you know, and, and I suppose then, um, you know, into the 2000s, uh, into the millennium, when life just started to become very different, you know, very different. So obviously, technology took a big foothold, you know, in people's lives, certainly in the working environment. Um, you know, and then if you go through the 2000s into 2005, 2006, um, my uh, wife at the time, uh, we both decided we were going to part company, amicable decision to, you know, obviously uh, get divorced. And what that allowed me to do, you know, was quite simply um, allow me to almost start to live out my legacy. And what I mean by that is quite simply this, that I've always enjoyed helping people. Okay. I, I've always enjoyed giving my time to other people because I do. And, and, and not for anything back in return is a, is a great word called reciprocity. And it means giving out for nothing and not expecting anything back in return, you know, and, and when I then moved to Cardiff after my divorce, started working, you know, in Cardiff, um, had a wonderful job, you know, big salary, company car, you know, all the bells and whistles, um, you know, I, I had the weekends off, you know, so it, it allowed me then to um, continue racing triathlon. I was a keen rock climber. Um, I qualified as a paragliding pilot, you know, in 2008. And, uh, and then in 2009, you know, whilst working for this company in Cardiff, um, the paragliding uh, team club, whatever you want to call it, that I was part of, we arranged then to go fly in on the 2nd of May 2009 along the Gower Peninsula, you know, in, uh, in southwest Wales, uh, an amazing, tranquil, stunning part of Wales, the coastline, you know, hundreds of miles of just wonderful, perfect beaches you know for for the united kingdom so so that's where it all started i guess my friend you know the end of one life and the beginning of a new one and it was just like that it was as easy as one two three they say so explain to my listeners what actually happened what events unfolded yes well if i can take the listeners back you know to that afternoon uh, which was, as I said, the 2nd of May, 2009. And it was a bank holiday weekend here in the United Kingdom. And we'd arranged to go paragliding above the Gower Peninsula, above the beaches in South Wales. There were 21 other paragliding pilots. So, you know, I was in good company, which is a good thing. And that day was, um, yeah, it was almost perfect flying conditions. You know, it was 21 degrees we had a 13 or 14 mile an hour headwind, you know, coming in off the Irish Sea. And, and the flights that we had that day, you know, were just, just mind blowing, you know, four, five, 600 feet above the beach, just watching. I can still see it now, just watching um, the coastline, you know, just seeing the, you know, the people walking dogs on the beach, people having picnics and barbecues. And yeah, it was just a, a moment in time I'll never forget, you know. And then that afternoon, after having, you know, hours of, of flight time that day, um, we, we were sat there just having a coffee at probably about five o'clock. And one of my friends said to me, you know, should we go back up? Should we go back up? Should we launch the canopies, you know, obviously hitch up on the harnesses and, uh, and just have maybe about, maybe one more hour of flight before, you know, the sun starts to set and the wind drops for the, for the wonderful day that we were having, you know? And I'll never forget that Saturday, um, just sitting on the hillside thinking, yeah, why not? Why not? You know? And then literally 15 minutes later, I'm flying across the top ridge, you know, above uh, Rossilly Beach, you know, in southwest Wales. And I remember flying probably about 40 feet above the ground. So I'm soaring across the top ridge and just feeling the sunshine on my face. You know, we'd had a wonderful day. And I remember just pulling on my left brake just to turn the canopy, you know, slightly to start facing the Irish Sea to get then obviously the lift from the thermals off the hillside. And as I turned that sort of, you know, 75, 80, 85, 90 degrees into the, the, the headwind, my, my paragliding canopy 
for whatever reason, just collapsed. You know, just collapsed. And I'm, I'm, I'm literally 40 feet, as I said, above the ground. I get this complete collapse from the canopy. Well, you've not got to be a rocket scientist to work out what's going to happen next. You know, I'm flying along at probably about 20 miles an hour, you know, and, uh, and just this instant feeling, you know, this instant feeling of apprehension, fear, doubt, uncertainty, everything just threw into the mix. And I'm looking down at the grass and I can still see my flying boots below me now, you know, as I look down and the ground's coming up, Callum, just literally at a rate of knots. And it's almost like it was in slow motion, you know, and it probably took me about two seconds to hit the floor. And as I hit the floor, I can still hear the thud now, just this almighty thud. And as I hit the floor, because remember, I'm attached to the canopy with a harness, the, the wind which was swirling over the top ridge that afternoon, it reinflated my canopy, you know, and, and I got dragged uncontrollably, fully conscious, by the way, for almost 100 meters, completely uncontrollably, you know, just tumbling, doing cartwheels, smashing my head on the floor. And just thinking back now, how the hell I survived, I, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. And after, I, I can't remember how long, but it must have been at least, you know, 90 to 100 meters. I finally stopped tumbling. I finally stopped being dragged. And I'm lying on the floor, on my back, just staring up at this, this stunning blue sky. And just thinking to myself, oh my gosh, that was really close. <laughs> because I'm in no pain, which was really weird. Um, you know, I, I could move my arms. So the first thing that I tried to do was, was to start to pull in, you know, the, the paragliding lines to ensure that the paragliding canopy didn't reflate, uh, didn't reinflate and then drag me even further, you know? And as I sort of tried to sit up, put my head looking down my body, my legs were, were really twisted. And I mean, like, like almost like branches on a tree. And I thought to myself, why can't I move my legs? Oh my gosh, what, why can't I move my legs? And at that point, I thought I broke both my legs. You know, there's no feeling, there's no pain, there's no movement. And I literally put my head back on the grass. And I thought to myself, I need to turn on my side because if I pass out, you know, and I, and I vomit, I need to be on my side in the recovery position, you know? Yeah. And I, I physically couldn't move. I physically couldn't move my body, my legs. So I literally grabbed my, I think it was my, I'm sure it was my right leg, if I remember, and literally dragged my leg over my left leg to try and turn myself on, onto my side into the recovery position. But I, I couldn't, I physically couldn't, you know, there was no movement, no feeling, no pain. It was really weird, you know? And I'll never forget looking up into the sky and seeing one of our paragliding pilots, you know, looping down, um, and I'm watching this guy land, you know, he, he, he unclipped his harness, pulled in his lines as he's literally r running towards me. So this guy almost put his, his own life at risk that afternoon. You know, and I'm so grateful that um, he arrived. He, he looked down at me. He's staring down at me. And he says these words to me. Oh, my gosh. Are you still alive? I said, yes, but... I, I, I can't feel my legs. Now, this gentleman um, is a, a gentleman who used to be part of the special forces in, in the United Kingdom. So he's fully trained as a medic and, and he knew what to do. So, you know, he did his checks on me. You know, he took his jacket off. He put his jacket over me to keep me warm, you know, because I started to get this chill at this point, you know, where all the blood in my body was, was rushing to the damaged area. And he immediately radioed for the Wales Air Ambulance, who, who thankfully turned up in about 10 or 11 minutes later, you know, to, to do their checks, to do their evaluation, um, you know, to stabilize me with a, 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 a neck collar, a specialized neck collar. And then, you know, very carefully, six, six men basically lifted me very, very carefully 
onto the spinal board because they didn't know what I'd done because they knew that I'd done something pretty serious, you know. So that when, that's when I was airlifted off to, you know, the, the local hospital and uh, had my, you know, my stabilization process go through, um, you know, in hospital. And that night, you know, I was told after having an x-ray and an MRI that unfortunately I'd, uh, I'd broken my back, you know, at the age of 40. And you suddenly think, I never forget the, the doctor giving me the news, you know, he said, Mark, I've got some really bad news for you. You know, you've broken your back. And I kept thinking, did he just say I've broken my back? Surely not. Because that, as we said earlier on, is the first stage of change, denial. You know, I didn't want it to be true, you know. And then the shock. Really? No. And then the anger. Then the anger. Then the warrior in me really, um, you know, raised its, uh, its ugly, ugly head, I guess, you know. Well, I just have to take a moment to sort of let that sink in, as I'm sure my listeners and viewers are doing the same. As I can't even comprehend how that felt. How does it feel looking back, thinking, how the hell did you survive? Yeah, I think the first thing that I'm grateful for is that, you know, I, I didn't die that afternoon. You know, um, even the, the doctor, even the consultant who, you know, finally operated on me. Um, because I broke T12 uh, vertebrae, I had a huge, what they call thoracic fracture uh, in T12, where when I hit the floor, the, the vertebrae literally cracked, you know. Um, so having uh, six titanium pins inserted into my spine to stabilize my back, you know, thinking back now, I'm so grateful for the NHS in the UK for, you know, for, for doing the operation successfully, you know. Um, and just looking back, thinking, yeah, how the hell did I get through it? Um, there, there were some really dark times, um, some really difficult times. And yeah, maybe, maybe it's just the, yeah, maybe it's just the, the inert ability to, to deal with change, you know, or, or be it through mindset, you know. But yeah, it was, it was tough, mate. It was really tough, actually. Were there any times afterwards when, you lacked that spark and that drive mentally. Were you close to throwing the towel in at time of thinking, what's the point? A hundred percent, you know, many times, you know, probably I can count them on two hands when after spending 94 days on my back, completely paralyzed, um, not having any feeling, no movement, you know, I was stabilized on morphine, you know, for, for, for quite some time. And, um, and not really knowing what the future was going to hold, you know, and that's going through that process again of denial, shock, anger, loneliness. And when I'd hit that part of loneliness, that's when the tears just didn't stop. And I remember saying to my parents, you know, um, please, can you find out about euthanasia? Um, I believe that it's available in Europe and, you know, just take my savings out of my bank account, book me in, let me have the injection and just get it over and done with. And that, that may sound quite cold, okay? It may sound very harsh, but that's how I felt, you know? And I'll never forget my late father saying to me one night, this is quite a, a powerful story, and my parents came to visit me in hospital one night, and it may have been after, I don't know, three months, three and a half months, I can't remember now. I wish I'd kept the diary calendar, if I'm honest, but I'll never forget my dad catching hold of me one night, you know, by literally by the scruff of the neck. He literally caught hold of my T-shirt, you know, with his, you know, with his grip of, of his fist. And he said to me, listen now, you listen to me. You're going to get through this. You stop crying. You stop feeling sorry for yourself. You pull yourself together because you're a winner. Now, you've never given up on anything in your life ever. Why are you going to give up now? I said, Dad, I broke my bloody back. I broke my back. Come on. And he was like, and? And? Why would you give up? And I thought to myself, do you know what? He's got a point. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a point. But what he did, Callum, he took me from the, the negative mindset I was in, apart from 
I, I thought he was going to slap me across the face. Yeah. <laughs> to take me into a positive mindset from negative to positive. And I'll never forget that moment, you know, and he said, look, you've got to stop upsetting your mother. You stop upsetting me. You stop upsetting yourself. Okay. And you focus. You focus on what you can do rather than what you can't do. Okay. And that's exactly what you've done. You focused on what you could do, which was changing the situation you were in. Okay. You, you, looked, for, you looked for a process. Okay. First of all, we look for hope. And you found hope in the process. Yeah. Okay? So then it's just having belief in you following the process. And that's all I did through my rehabilitation was have belief in the process, belief in the organization, being the, the National Health Service, belief in myself. And then the fourth pillar is having belief in myself doing the process. You know? So then when I left hospital after six months, and, you know, I didn't go back to work to start with, you know, I signed on benefits to ensure that I had some money coming in because for me, it was all about functionality and, and just getting myself well again, you know, yeah. just, just almost going back into that normal environment, albeit a difficult environment because I was on walking aids, um, you know, on crutches, I have to wear um, ankle supports because I've got drop foot in both feet. Um, so what that means is that both my feet don't work. So I've got no push or no pull in both feet. My calf muscles don't fire because of nerve damage. My hamstrings don't fire because of nerve damage. My glutes, in other words, my bum muscles, they don't fire, you know, because of nerve damage. And, and that gives the, that, I, I guess that gives the listeners, um, uh, I suppose an idea now of who I am. And I walk like Charlie Chaplin, which is fine. Yeah. You know, I accept it. Um, and I have this, this very slow walk and waddle, you know, which is fine because I can walk. And that's, that's a big benefit for me, you know. So, so if you fast forward, you know, maybe nine or ten months after my accident, um, what I found was because my quads and my hip flexors still fire, I could actually cycle. You know, I'll never forget my, my late dad helping me onto the bike, uh, onto my, my, my road racing bike and, uh, and clipping in, clipping in my cycling shoes, you know, into the pedals and found that I could push and pull, you know, on the pedals, which allowed me then, you know, to rotate the pedals. And that was just the start of, yeah, that, that was just the start of a new life, a new epic life. And obviously, only time could tell, and it really did. From a personal note, you can read about your story, you can read about what happened to you, but hearing it here and now has struck a different chord to me than reading about it online. So I want to just take this chance to thank you for sharing that with me and my listeners, as I know they probably feel exactly the same as me. My right pleasure. Now. No, it is my pleasure. And for people listening to this podcast who have, I don't know, a disability, okay, for people who have a stammer, for people who are maybe visually impaired or maybe blind, okay, people who have had, um, you know, accidents, whether they are an amputee or maybe even born, you know, with a disability, okay. My, my wish for you is that you, um, you find something in life that you enjoy, which is paramount, um, that you can help other people to experience that feeling, you know, and, and enjoy the journey because, you know, it's so, so important. So, so yeah, 12 months after my accident, you know, I started cycling and I, I'll never forget um, participating in a charity cycle ride with the Wales Ambulance because we were raising money because I wanted to give back. And, and I met this chiropractor. I'd, I'd never met this guy before. And he said to me, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, of course. And as I said earlier on, I treat everybody like my best friend, you know. And he said, what's wrong with your legs? So I explained with my, you know, my orthosis or my ankle supports and, you know, my, my crutches, my Charlie Chaplin walk, you know. And he said, what's wrong with your legs? So I explained, broke my back 12 months ago you know, broke T12, thoracic fracture, lower leg paralysis, 
walk like Charlie Chaplin, but I can cycle, you know? And after a 20 minute conversation about my accident, my disability, my mindset, he said to me, can I ask you one last question? I said, yes, of course. Now this was, the date was the, um, the 10th of June, 2010. I'll never forget this, this, this date. And he said to me, um, are, you, um, are you training for the London 2012 Paralympic Games? I said, sorry? He said, you know, the Paralympics in two years time, are you training for the games? I said, no. Why the hell would I do that? I'm 41 years of age, you know? And he said to me, I think you should. Thank you for listening to what was part one of my interview with Mark Colburn here on the Schofield Stories. I hope you really enjoyed it, as I know I definitely did. I look forward to seeing you back here again, part two.